Hi, this is Uncommon Sense from the Sociological Review. I'm Rosie Hancock in Sydney, Australia. And I'm Alexis Hutrong in Ottawa, Canada. And this is where we take a sideways glance, well, like more of a long stare, really, at everyday notions we don't usually uh, stop to consider, from the idea of Europe to the concept of emotion, and give them a bit of a twist, seeing them differently, more critically, and yeah, more sociologically. Today, we're talking about nature, because while it's increasingly being recognised, though not fast enough, that we cannot take nature as we know it for granted, we still seem lost as to what nature actually is. Is it external to us? Is it part of us? Is it something we flee the city to consume before heading home? Or is it all around us? In fact, what do we even mean when we say we or us? What are the limits of those words? And is this idea of humans as distinct from nature that universal anyway? Alexis, before I introduce our guest today, I'm going to ask you our usual question. What does our theme today mean to you? Well, actually, I recently have come to realize that I have a really simplistic view of nature. Like, basically, it's just about anything that's outside of the city. And... And yeah, so, so recently one of my students in a community intervention MA seminar, his name is Jean-Francois Harper, uh, like he worked and got me thinking about challenging this divide to think about things like biodemocracy and animal and even plant uh, consent. I mean, t- to me, I guess nature is literally anything not man-made. Although, like a lot of people, the first thing that pops into my head is an idyllic forest scene when when the word nature gets mentioned. It's it's also, I mean, nature is also something I'm interested in professionally, as a lot of my research is on religious environmental activism. And as an undergraduate, I studied political philosophy, which also has its own ideas about human nature, which is very much tied into what we're talking about today. Well, our guest today is Catherine Oliver, who lectures in sociology, drawing on her background in geography at the University of Lancaster in the UK. She writes a lot about the more than human or beyond human, with a particular focus on chickens and more. Katie, we're going to call you Katie. Welcome to Uncommon Sense. Thank you for having me. It's really nice to be here. Katie, you teach the sociology of climate change. Can you explain what that is? And I guess I'm asking because I'm wondering how can the social sciences contribute to our understanding of those fields that some, including policymakers, might think of as primarily in the like natural sciences subjects? Like, how do we explain to people that disciplines like geography, sociology, social psychology, and of course, anthropology have something to add here? Yeah, it's a really good question uh, because when we think of climate change, and this is particularly from like policy, media perspectives, we think about we've got to we've got to fix climate change, we've got to intervene for climate change, and that all all these things that we have to do are in the popular conception thought of as technological, scientific, mm-hmm. engineering. And while I'm not, obviously I'm not going to discount the the role of science in climate change, we can't begin to understand and therefore combat climate change and the climate crisis without thinking about the social role uh, and the role of society in producing climate change and producing the climate crisis, the ways we behave, act, our histories in yeah, creating the world that we're in now, but also working to change it. All right. So Katie, our theme today is nature. And I think it's fair to say that there's this problematic way, though it's certainly like not the only way, despite being dominant in what you might call the West, in which the natural world has been thought of for a really long time as something out there that's distinct from society. And and how have the social sciences uh, contributed to this problematic understanding, including, say, political philosophy, actually, and which Rosie mentioned earlier with its idea of the human nature. Yeah, so, so the, the kind of human nature binary is, is a long-standing one, and it's been taken up differently in different disciplines. So it's, it's very different in the discipline I've been trained in geography to sociology, as geography has this kind of at mm-hmm. its heart, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it is a physical science as well as a human or a social science. So geography has approached, um, but it, st- it still did the same thing, right, and separated human 
from nature, but in sociology specifically, sociology as a discipline was trying to carve out an identity for itself that was distinct from anthropology, that was distinct from geography, that was distinct from all these other social sciences. And in that, in that way, it, it focused on society and almost put the environmental, put nature on the back burner. And it's only in the kind of last 50 years or so that that started to change. And environmental sociology has kind of really seen, has seen a massive growth in ideas like the more than human more recently. Yes, yeah, so yeah, this this binary that separates humans as outside of nature is one that's been set up in order to study humans, to reproduce a hierarchy um, in order to understand mm. and separate the two. And I mentioned earlier, Katie, that these ideas about humans being distinct from nature are far from universal. I wonder if we can expand that a bit here. In my own field, I know we can look to, say, Jainism or animism for alternative frameworks. But actually, it's it's not always necessary to jump to those examples, which can actually be problematic, yeah, because it can risk exoticizing and simplifying those cultures. On that, actually, I've learned so much recently from collaborating with Tyson Yunkaporter, an Indigenous scholar here in Australia, and his book, Sand Talk, we'll put in our show notes, along with some fascinating work from the anthropologist and researcher artist Zoe Todd. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm curious, like on this idea of, of, of being distinct, right, or, or, or maybe what Katie, you said, like the hierarchies, yeah? um, you're interested in the idea of the more than human and the beyond human. Can you tell us, uh, yeah, about the meaning of those phrases? So, so the more than human is having a kind of massive moment across the social sciences. But it's also this phrase that I'm not saying it doesn't mean anything. It does mean things, but it's been taken up in different ways. And that's quite confusing. But, but the more than, what the more than human is essentially doing in various different ways is looking at things beyond the human, animals, plants, things and the human, but as interconnected as this kind of web of, and these are all the kinds of terms you hear in this field, right? Webs of relations, interconnectedness, entanglements, and it's all kind of very positive and affirmative uh, and looking at the complexities of the ways that humans sit in worlds with others, uh, non-human others and non-sentient others. Um, and, and it becomes quite complicated, especially when I'm teaching this for, for everyone to know what the difference is between all these bits of language, the post-human, the more than human, the multi-species, the this, the, you know, the, the, there's a lot of, there's a lot of phrases that I think we know what they mean, sort of, it's kind of intuitive, but you're all, I, even me, I've, I've been doing this for kind of 10 years and I'm still scared of putting my foot in it, but I'm, I'm particularly kind of my work, uh, particularly earlier in my career, I, I was kind of frustrated by the idea of the more than human. Uh, and looking back, uh, some of that ref frustration comes from the different ways it's used and the ways it's perhaps used in a way I wouldn't use it, particularly in relation to the hierarchies that we've been talking about, that the more than human implies uh, a less than human. And this is an idea that's being developed uh, in, in lots of places now. And, and I became really more interested in what's beyond the human. So what's not uh, he, not human, perhaps connected to the human, um, but not looking at, at it as an extension of the human. So trying to redress that hierarchy. Mm. Could you elaborate a bit on the idea of the beyond human, um, like maybe an example? In my PhD work, in my thesis, I worked briefly with chickens and I developed this relationship with chickens that I lived with. And there was nothing more than human about this relationship. There was just no way for me to describe in my work this relationship as more than human. It was just a, a, such a almost silly way to me to describe it. But it certainly wasn't just human. And that idea of extension uh, and, yeah, the, this, this bond as a beyond human thing. But it also incorporated the historical factors of what brought me and those chickens together as well as kind of the emotional and beyond oh. death as well as so the chickens died. Spoiler alert, if you're going to read my book, the chickens die in the end. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, just generally moving away from the specifics of language, what's clear here is that there's a, a real challenge around acknowledging, centering and respecting non-human life without just anthropomorphizing it, which is attributing human characteristics and emotions and so on to animals and, and non-human things, or, or also conversely acting as though we humans can totally grasp the worldview of kind of non-human animals. 
how are scholars addressing this or how should they? Yeah, so it's a really good question. The question of anthropomorphism is one that dominates this this kind of field of animal studies and nature studies. I actually saw a brilliant talk by a PhD student at Manchester this week called Paige Colton, and she was talking about uh, how in the in the history of science, anthropomorphization is something we're biologically and evolutionarily compelled to do. It's developed so that we have empathy with other species in order for us to live together. Um, and this, I just thought this was brilliant. It like blew my mind this week because I'd never looked at it from that science perspective. She was doing kind of a philosophy of science PhD. And so anthropomorphism is presented as this problem. We need to not anthropomorphize. Uh, and some of that she was saying basically in her talk is from science and testing, uh, animal testing. Uh, we need to not anthropomorphize animals so that we can do terrible things to them in the name of science was the, uh, was the argument. But anthropomorphization is something we're compelled to do because it helps us to connect. And the problem of anthropomorphism and constantly focusing on we shouldn't anthropomorphize actually prevents us from moving the conversation to other issues. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's always presented as this problem and it, it's not really a problem. I think it's fine to anthropomorphize as long as we can also understand that those aren't humans, those are animals that have their own experiences of the world and those experiences are just as important as ours. And I think that's the bit that kind of is, yeah, to move beyond that, just to use the kind of, kind of language I was using earlier. Mm. I mean, like there's this, uh, I mean, it was interesting and we were having a chat um, before we started recording about, you know, animals are clever and 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 using that language of like, cleverness for an- for animals and and saying like you know like of course of course you know pigs are clever but, but they're clever doing pig things and there's this great um there's this there's this scholar called uh, Laurie Beeman she's a religious like a sociologist of religion and she's written on sea turtle rescuers and she has this wonderful quote from one of her participants um saying turtles know turtle things and it's just such this and it's just this really kind of captivating expression that really kind of gets to the heart of this idea of like, you know, animals have their own life worlds um, and we can still kind of appreciate that and, you know, without necessarily getting into the weeds of, <laughs> of, of like, are we anthropomorphizing them? Are we not? Like, are we, are we doing the right kind of centering or not? Like, yeah, it's, a, it's such a, yeah. Um, but, you know, generally it strikes me that these really important ideas that you're bringing to the fore, which highlight porosity, relationships, and so on. Those are things we've touched on in previous episodes to do with care, intimacy, and which have been brought to the fore recently by people like the Care Collective with the Care Manifesto. I think this idea of interconnectedness kind of seems a basic sociological ethic, if you will, which your own work extends out towards the animal world. Would you agree with that? I think so. Yeah, I, th- I think care is another thing that's kind of really come to the foreground recently. And it's uh, in many ways, y- yes, I think it is trying to extend those relationships to animals. It's also about understanding the not care or the lack of care that's ex- extended out uh, as well, I suppose, as thinking about how we might extend um, care. Well, some of this brings us neatly to your work on Birmingham, a city where you lived for a while and observed the churn of urban regeneration. Uh, can you tell us about that? And actually, I'm thinking in particular of your work um, and writing on a group of bees being wrapped up in neoliberalism, essentially, like how do nature and neoliberalism, um, by which I'll tentatively define as the situation where we, we see states minimizing their interventions in the market and the economy and providing less support uh, and safeguards for citizens. But yeah, so how nature and neoliberalism intermingle in that particular case. What's the story there? So so to talk about the bees, I have to go back uh, a a bit further, actually, into the reason I wrote the paper. And the paper, I lived in Birmingham for 10 years, the first 10 years of my adult life. And in the year before I left the city, I lived in this rented house. And I lived in like 10, more than 10 places, probably over those 10 years, as many kind of young people renting and in precarious work situations, you just move a lot. And in the, in, the, in the garden of this rented house that I lived in, towards the end of my time in Birmingham, there was this tree. Uh, and I loved this tree. And I kind of sat under this mm. tree during during the pandemic and lockdowns. 
And one day, basically, my neighbour broke into my garden and cut the tree down. And I had no kind of rights or anything that I could do to stop him once he'd done it. He just took this part mm. of this tree away from me. But this we also took this tree away from the birds who sat in it, the cats who sat under it, the insects who lived on it, moss, you know, and, and the rest of the garden as well, who were all part of this ecology. So anyway, this, this tree might not seem related to the bees at the moment, but it is. But I started basically from there thinking about how many connections in the city I had lost because I was constantly kind of moving on, having to move on, having to find cheaper rent, having to move house, having to change jobs. And these, these connections were constantly being severed. And so earlier, you, we, I think you mentioned that um, we don't think about or we might not think about the city as a place for nature. But actually, the city is full of totally full of mm-hmm. nature. It's full to the brim of nature. But the kinds of nature that are in the city aren't the kinds of nature that sit comfortably with the need for the city to profit, the need for the city to expand, the need for the city to produce capital and to be a place to uh, kind of speculate on. And so things like rats, foxes, uh, insects, they're pushed. We don't want them in the city. Uh, Not we, us, literally in this room, but they're, they're not wanted in the city. So the city is kind of, for centuries, has been sanitized of, of nature, of animal life. But then it's brought in, a different kind of nature is brought in. So particular kinds of trees, particular kinds of landscaping. But then weeds are pulled out and kind of uh, kept away. Bins are put in so we don't get foxes or possums or whatever. But in Birmingham, uh, we used to have this, uh, this brutalist civic library in the heart of Birmingham. And they knocked it down and built on top of it. And uh, this has gone a long way round to get to the bees, but in in the kind of inside this place, which is called Paradise, um, because the development before was called Paradise, where the library was, uh, in in the kind of uh, building that's there now, or on this kind of big building, they brought in some bees as part of an urban nature project to have kind of some nature in the city that was seen as a positive kind of nature. But this beehive is is a honey beehive. It's totally cut off from public, so you can't see it uh, in case people were scared of the bees. So you can't see Mm. the bees, Um, but they're they're kind of kept in paradise in a kind of cut off bit to the public. And they produce honey and they're this kind of good sort of nature for the city, this good nature for the good city. They work, they produce, they don't get in the way and they're totally cut off from the public. What you mentioned, the story about the tree in the backyard really resonated. The, recently, I heard a story of a, of a person that during the pandemic was kind of going around naming trees. Um, and, and when someone cut one of them down, was really like caught up in an experience of mourning. And it, it really kind of emotionally puts us into reflecting on the tree as just a thing that's outside. But when you were speaking about it, it was really like, a part of of us, a part of of the, the 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 insects, the animals that were there. I mean, it's you know, it's often said that neoliberalism affects our prospects for building relationships with each other. Something people like Richard Sennett and Eva Alouz have long been talking about, and something we discussed recently in our show on breakups with Ilana Gershon. But what's really interesting in hearing about churn and regeneration in Birmingham is we see that this also hampers our relationship with what we call nature, yes? Yeah, totally. It totally changes how we understand nature and what nature is and relatedly ideas of where nature is. So is nature in the city and and what kinds of nature do we see in the city, for example? Uh, How do we, is if nature is something that's always elsewhere, outside, Uh, not in the city, not where we live, then we have a very different relationship to it than if we see nature as all around us. So you write of how, as the poor are driven from their homes by those in pursuit of capital, non-human life is caught up in the same. That's your words there, Katie. Um, I guess my question here harks back to the point we made just now about care. Um, but, you know, does, does thinking about vulnerable nature in cases like these make you think about vulnerable people too and how it's all connected? I mean, thinking about precarious labour in farming and agriculture, for example. Yeah, absolutely. So when we think about vulnerabilities between uh, between poor or workers and nature, it isn't separate. Those, those aren't separate processes. And we see this particularly in places like 
the slaughterhouse and in animal agriculture, where not only are obviously billions of animals subject to various kinds of cruelty, uh, damage, suffering, but so too are the workers, the human workers, as well as the animal workers, the human workers in those spaces. So there's obviously a, a huge psychological impact of slaughtering animals. There are also physical impacts, kind of muscle problems, skeletal problems, and then kind of respiratory problems from the conditions in slaughterhouses. And we saw this during COVID-19, actually, that slaughterhouses had some of the biggest outbreaks. Uh, and this is particularly kind of pertinent when we think about pandemics uh, and how zoonos- zo- zoonotic pandemics are kind of one of the biggest risks, risks we're seeing today. And slaughterhouse workers and animal workers are at the absolute front lines of risk. And so they are absolutely thrown into these vulnerable situations and, and also missed uh, or kind of not thought about as key workers or important workers, but as disposable, totally disposable, vulnerable life. Just finally, Katie, you you mentioned this, this question of like, where is nature uh, in talking about the vulnerable nature, how it is vulnerable, and, and also in, touched on the question of what kind of nature, uh, or maybe whose nature we are talking about. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, if you could expand a bit, because although the nature that best works for humans might not exist forever, it would be human-centric to think that if we become extinct, say, uh, then does nature also, right? So won't there always be some kind of nature? Like pandemics are also, I guess, natural. Um, yeah, as, as we recently learned. Yeah, definitely. So humans are, humans are just a, p- a part of nature and nature existed long before us and will exist long after us. What humans are doing, though, is changing the possibilities or foreshortening the possibilities of what nature will exist after us. So the, the extinction of species means that those species won't exist even when we've gone. But nature in some form uh, will persist and the kinds of nature that will persist are actually the kinds of nature that we humans don't value. So things or species like rats, cockroaches, weeds, Japanese knotweed, all these species that are seen as the ones we should dig up, uh, get rid of, try and get rid of, the ones that are thriving actually, uh, are the ones that are going to exist beyond us. Well, on that, Katie, we're going to take a moment to pause and hear from our producer, Alice, after which we'll be back to hear about your work on chickens. Hi, and thanks for listening to Uncommon Sense, where we're with Katie Oliver talking about nature. If you're enjoying this, you might want to catch our earlier shows on subjects like bodies, care and cities. You can find them and some great, really surprising reading lists all in our archive and over at the podcast page at thesociologicalreview.org. And remember, please do, as I always say, tap follow or subscribe in the app you're using to hear this. It really does help us to bring more Uncommon Sense to you and to make sure you never miss a show, including some great episodes we've got coming up later this year. Back to Rosie. Okay, let's turn now to chickens, because that brings to life some of this thinking on the beyond human and on what it might truly mean to sustain nature in a way that's not solely centred on human needs. Katie, you've written a lot about chickens. How did that happen? I just love chickens, which which seems a silly a silly answer. But I, I started keeping chickens, or I had six chickens. Me and my mum had six chickens. Uh, a few years ago, we got them while I was doing my, my PhD. And these were like rehome chickens. They were previously commercial chickens. As I sort of mentioned before, they sort of totally transformed what I was thinking about. They changed how I was thinking about theory, about my work. But they were also just my, my friends. They were like my little chicken friends. Uh, and I just absolutely love them. And the more I thought about and got to know chickens and read about chickens and about what other people were saying about chickens, the more interest I became, but also felt like there was more to say about chickens than just chickens are this symbol of the end of the world, this symbol of capitalism. Oh, look at the chicken. That, that's kind of the biggest take. People like um, Raj Patel and Jason Moore talk about the chicken nugget as a symbol of capitalism geologists like Catherine Bennett and and colleagues have written about how chickens are the signal species of the Anthropocene and they're always figure in social social sciences and the sciences as this kind of figure of disaster 
But if any of the listeners have met a chicken, they will know chickens are not figures of disaster. They're, they're wonderful beings full of life and full of, they have a really, a really kind of rich history. Uh, and so now I basically just can't stop researching chickens because every time I try, I just really miss chickens and just go back to them, go back to thinking about them. You're in good company. The, the novelist Alice Walker, more famous for the color purple, uh, also wrote about chickens. What did she have to say? And how does that fit, uh, I guess, with your own work on, on chickens and the rhythms of human and particularly uh, urban life? Something I know you've written about uh, for the Sociological Review, actually. Yeah, so Alice Walker has a, a memoir called The Chicken Chronicles. And in this memoir, she writes about how she, uh, kind of in her later life, got chickens. She got some chickens, she lived with some chickens and then went through this process of getting to know chickens as simultaneously a kind of harking back to her childhood in the South, of kind of reminding her of this, this kind of life she had, this more rural life, but also as getting to know chickens as a, a realization or, or a way into, I think she puts it, and I'm slightly paraphrasing here, but as the, a way into seeing the parallel world that all other animals exist in. So these other perspectives of the world. And it's just, it's just a brilliant book. I, re I recommend it to everyone. Um, but she, she writes about how chickens teach you a lot. Living with chickens teaches you a lot kind of about care, but also about how the world could be different. And so that's what I think about in the, in the article I wrote for the Sociological Review magazine, which is about this history of chickens as Uh, they're quite famously in history, time keepers, keepers the cockerel, um, and how we've lost. So, so history, chickens and humans, just to kind of take back, have a 10,000 year history. And I'm not the first or only person to say that chickens and humans kind of co-domesticated. So that a lot of our knowledge about things like nutrition mm. come from the chicken. Uh, and uh, we kind of developed together our culture, our society, our food, our history, our science, A lot of it comes from, I'm not going to say all of it, a lot of it comes from the chicken. But we've, we obviously don't have chickens. Most of us, almost all of us in the West, don't have chickens. We don't see chickens. Chickens are, for the most part, uh, everywhere in the world, kept in vast farms. We do not have a cultural relationship with actual chickens. Uh, alive chickens, I should say. We do obviously have a cultural and social relationship with dead chickens uh, through eating. So, yes, yeah, so, so, The work I was doing with chickens in the city looked at how when people start to keep chickens in the city, they start to slow down. They start to think differently about companionship. They start to think differently actually about the city itself as a space that doesn't have to be a space of fast paced life. You can curate little vignettes almost in the city and chickens can teach us to do that with the caveat that obviously to keep chickens in the city, you have to be quite privileged. Mm. I mean, yeah, because as we've alluded to already, this practice of domestic chicken keeping isn't free of complexity, is it? Or um, sort of apart from the mainstream. You've, you've written on the turn to this practice of rehoming old chickens amid the recent pandemic. Can you tell us about that? You say it remains to be seen whether COVID's impact on more than human communities forms a promising long-term shift or whether it's just the human as usual. Yeah, yeah. So so uh, I guess to respond immediately to that second point that I wrote about two years ago, I think we now do know that it's the, the human as usual. I think I was maybe more hope, hopeful then. Um, but during COVID, we saw a huge increase in people keeping chickens. So in the UK, which is where my research is based, chickens sold out. And many, many, many of the chickens in the UK are rehomed. So domestic chickens are rehomed through charities that basically get old end of, I think it's called end point of end of lay hens. So they don't produce an egg a day anymore. They kind of, their, their eggs produce, production slows down. And so they're no longer financially viable for animal agriculture, about 18 months old. And for context, because I'm assuming everyone doesn't know about chickens, a chicken can live for eight years if it's not a chicken who's in industrial agriculture. Industrial chickens uh, are normally killed at 18 months. But these charities in the UK help facilitate rehoming of chickens into domestic spaces. And I, at this point, when I was doing this research, I thought that this spike in kind of domestic chicken keeping might think might 
and, and actually it does, I'm, I'm being unfair. In the people who are keeping chickens, it produces a new kind of companionship, new ecological understandings, new environmental empathies, new kind of understandings of the chicken. Even if they'd got the chicken initially just for eggs, um, actually, but it's, it still had this impact of changing people's minds about chickens and about nature and about food systems, regardless of why people had got chickens. So while the, the meta story, I suppose, the big story is that it is the human as usual, that are also these kind of resistant vignettes of, of chickens as well. Mm. I mean, you know, that's <laughs> that's real food for thought, for want of a better phrase. Uh, <laughs> and also... <laughs> Also a reminder, again, that the shape of human-animal relations can be specific to cultures, um, but also to periods in time, like things can be different. Anyway, Katie, we wanted to move now to the bit of the show where we either look at something, a theory, a thinker, a concept that's made our guests think differently, or we take hold of a buzzword and see it more critically, all in the name of generating a bit more uncommon sense. Today, via your work on chickens, we wanted to talk about the notion of thriving, which is perfect because you have already used that word in this conversation. Katie, in one of your pieces on chicken farming, so we're, we're no longer talking about the cozier practices of rehoming yet we just discussed, you suggest that the threat of extinction can haunt even the most prolific of species, like in this case, the chicken. And that seems mind blowing to me. It's like you're saying that thriving and extinction aren't mutually exclusive. Like a, a species could both be thriving and kind of dead in a way. Is that is that correct? Can you explain that? Yeah, I can. I can explain it. Um, so, so the idea of the chicken. We have 33 billion chickens on the planet at any any point. Uh, we kill 70 billion chickens a year. So 33 billion. That's more. There's more chickens than the collective biomass of all the other birds on the planet. Mm. There's more chickens. There's just a lot of chickens. Um, and by kind of measures of what is thriving, what does it mean for a species to be thriving? If there's 33 billion of them, then of course they're thriving, right? These chickens are the furthest thing from extinct you can get. In fact, in, in environmental narratives, chickens are posed as, chickens like cows, are posed as threatening other species with extinction. Mm. So uh, through pollution of rivers, as we, we've seen in the UK, through the cr cutting down of uh, forests to produce agricultural land, more, more for cows, but also for uh, chicken mega farms, that they're actually posed as causing the problem, obviously not them, them specifically, they cause the problem of extinction of other species. What I argue is that actually the chicken is already extinct the chicken doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the chicken was always a, a kind of bred animal. The chicken descends from various kinds of fowl that were then crossbred to produce the chicken. And then at the kind of turn of the 20th century, 1900, the ge genomes in the chicken were split uh, to kind of simplify it to produce uh, egg laying hens and meat hens. Uh, and then around 1945, and we saw another change in the chicken genome, basically to intensify chicken production. So the chicken, uh, there's, a, there's a book by uh, a biologist and a historian called The Chicken Book. Uh, they're called Paige Smith and Charles Daniels. And in 1975, they wrote in this book that if we continued on the way we were going with chickens at that point, then the thing that we know as a chicken would no longer exist. And the thing we knew as an egg would no longer exist. Um, so that's, that was the kind of argument that I was taking up in this paper, that even though we have these chickens, uh, 33 billion of them, they don't exist. There is no such thing. They're already extinct. There's no way back for the chicken. When we think about um, veganism or alternative eating or changing our food systems, animals like the chicken aren't going to go back to being thriving parts of nature um, there's there's no place, there's no imagination for what's going to happen to the chicken. The chicken is just as good mm -hmm. as dead in any uh, of these kind of mainstream narratives of what we can do, uh, what we can do about the environment. The chicken is already extinct. Your work on something called metabopolitics also highlights how capitalism manufactures and manipulates a version of thriving that works best for its own ends. Can you explain what metabopolitics actually is, perhaps with examples for uh, from some of the work you've you've done, co-authored with Jonathan Turnbull, including on the cow? I can, and I'm going to credit Jonathan with the 
term, metabo politics. I'm going to credit also, we have another co author on forthcoming pieces called Adam Searle, who's doing lots of this work as well. So, when we started to think about metabolism, metabolism is becoming a, kind of a popular thing to think about in sociology, anthropology, the social sciences, to think about metabolism um, in eating, but also the metabolism of nature, a kind of Marxian idea. Uh, but when we were thinking about metabo politics and metabolism, we were specifically thinking about, actually, we were specifically thinking about the cow and the way that the cow, who is a figure um, known basically for destroying the climate, the, ca- the cow is a climate villain. The cow is going to kill us all by farting methane, farting us into oblivion. Um, so, so we began, we, we basically interviewed a lot of scientists and looked at scientific discourse around the politics of control of the cow metabolism to produce a better climate outcome. And so some of these interventions, the one we we focus on a lot is seaweed. So adding seaweed to cows diets to reduce the amount they fart, therefore reduce methane. Uh, There are various other kinds of interventions. So there are things like adding VR headsets to cows. I'm not entirely sure how that works. Um, <laughs> things like CRISPR and genome editing, which is what Adam Searle works a lot on CRISPR and gene, gene editing, selective breeding, a more kind of rudimentary process. Uh, and this process of um, cannulation, which is a very old school practice in agriculture, where basically a hole is cut in the side of a cow um, and you can then reach in and pick out bits of corn and things that would make the cow, originally they would make the cow um, basically sick, but now this is being used to pick out bits of the diet and test things, uh, test the cow's metabolism to see how we can produce less methane. And I think there's a picture of this cannulation process in mine and uh, Jonathan's essay, if you want to see it, it really is, it really grossed me out. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, this, but that, that figure of, kind of literally reaching into the metabolism of the cow and messing around in order to produce a good cow for a good climate, for a good Anthropocene, is where we're thinking about metabo politics. It is relevant to other places, but that is the kind of example that we look at specifically. Well, I mean, I don't really know where to go after that example. (laughs) I mean, so... I guess we could also, you know, just just kind of changing tack <laughs> quite suddenly away from holes in the sides of cows. Um, you know, could we maybe try and complicate an idea related to thriving, which is that of flourishing? I think you wanted to highlight the work of Anna Singh, who's written about living on a damaged planet. Can you tell us about her? Yeah, I can. Famously, her most kind of popular book, I suppose, is a book about mushrooms, uh, a mushroom at the end of the world. And she follows uh, this particular kind of mushroom and the people who harvest it to think about how we live and flourish on a damaged planet and also sort of the things that will survive us. Um, And mushrooms are having, I'm kind of going off topic a little bit here, but mushrooms are having a real moment that this kind of weird thing that um, allows us to to think differently about the world, which is what Anna Singh's doing, uh, but also looking around the economies and the cultures uh, around that uh, and these, these kind of, yeah, flourishing ways of life in crisis and in damage, which has been really taken up quite, Um, it's been taken up in many, many ways across the social sciences to think about flourishing as what we should be aiming for, that we should be able to, this is a gross oversimplification, but that we have to think about, we've got this damaged planet, we've got this crisis. How do we find ways through that that aren't just despairing and aren't just giving over to um, disaster. And this idea of flourishing is is a really popular one, one that I sort of take issue with being so popular because you can't have you can't have one thing flourishing without another thing being destroyed, or one thing flourishing without a series of other things being destroyed. There is there's no vacuum for any one species to flourish. That it's a kind of interconnected series of complicated uh, ecologies of things that that allow flourishing to happen. And this is a kind of broader affirmative, uh, I suppose, strand or positive strand of thought in this theory that we want to end up somewhere that's positive and that there is a future to look forward to and that our new worlds to come. Uh, and that's being challenged by people. I'm going to mention the work of Thomas Decasia here, 
who writes about what if there aren't worlds to come? What if there is a world, a worldless future? And has really thought about negativity and negation uh, as well to, to challenge those ideas that, that we should be thinking about flourishing and these possible worlds and that it uh, basically by deferring that responsibility onto a future Uh, We're cheating ourselves. We're deferring responsibility to the future as well. So we're almost out of time, but before we go, we just want to have a quick whip around to grab everyone's tips on something that is not academic and that speaks to today's theme. And I'm actually going to jump in with mine, which is... Captain Planet, which is like a, a 90s show. I'm not sure if you, if you know that, but yeah, it was like basically five five teens who had rings and summoned a powerful being that, that kind of fought for the planet, fought pollution for the planet and, and so on, and, and also had amazing hairstyles. But yeah, there are, there are problematic things about that series, but it was also a fresh and interesting topic at that time giving us a snapshot of our relation to the environment. Yeah, and and already, I guess, kind of challenging the dichotomies we spoke about today with ideas like that of Gaia. So, And this idea of Gaia is now present in in an academic works like that of Bruno Latour, um, as Jean-Francois, my my, DMA student I told you about, has recently uh, taught me, yeah. I loved Captain Planet as a child and watched it all the time. So, you know, I feel very happy that you brought that up, Alexis. I'm going to bring up Margaret Atwood's Mad Adam trilogy, which is one of my all-time absolute favourite book series. It's basically about everything that we've talked about today. Capitalism, run amok, extinction, nature's regenerative powers on its own terms. I think everyone needs to go out and read it. It's wonderful. Katie, can we be bold enough to suggest you might want to talk about Andrea Arnold's film, Cow? <laughs> I, I know you've written about it and also understand that you had a pretty unusual viewing experience. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So I watched Andrea Arnold's Cow uh, when it came out, actually. It was, it was the week it came out. But I, I went to see it on my own on a Monday morning and I was the, the only person in the cinema. And I went into this totally empty cinema on a Monday morning I don't, I'm not going to spoiler the, the film, um, but it's a film that follows the life of a dairy cow in an English farm. There's no humans in, in the film. There's just this cow. Uh, and it follows the process of how, how she gives birth and is has her calves taken away to produce milk all the way through to her death. Uh, and it's it's incredibly moving. It's it's very um take tissues I suppose um it's it's an incredibly moving film and inc- incredibly powerful film because it totally removes um the the, the human and, and gives over this perspective that otherwise we wouldn't have that will have us thinking or had me thinking a lot about what happens to animals in these spaces mm. um, yeah well Katie that sounds like a really beautiful and potentially also quite upsetting film I imagine um but This is where we say goodbye. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's been brilliant to talk to you. And that is it for this month. We're out of time, but you can catch today's reading list, including some great pieces from the Sociological Review and the different texts, films, and novels we mentioned today over at the podcasts page at the sociologicalreview.org. We're taking a break for August, but we'll be back in September with an excellent episode, of course, all about performance. Thanks to our guest, Katie Oliver. Our sound engineer was Dave Crackles, and our producer was Alice Block. See you soon. Bye. Bye.